recognition uh, for their work in this field. And Peter Clegg, of course, from Fielden and Clegg, who, who have also um, gained uh, quite a high profile and reputation <coughs> for their work on energy efficient buildings. So tonight they're going to talk about breathable buildings and uh, Keith's going to speak first for about half an hour and then Peter will follow. So if we can introduce Keith. The Earth's green planet, the planet of life, the planet that sustains life. So what makes the Earth so different from everywhere else? Why is it so different from the Moon? One of the reasons it's 80 times more dense, and because of that it has a very strong gravitational force, and that keeps an atmosphere. And together with um, a surface temperature of about 15 degrees C, water stays on the Earth as a fluid, and the combination makes it a living planet. The atmosphere rotates around the world roughly at the same pace as the rotation of the Earth. It slips, it goes slower around the equator than it does at the North Pole and South Pole and the difference where the boundary layers of the atmosphere and the earth moves is a Corellis effect which sets up trade winds and that creates the wind effects around the world. Both the winds and the movement over water then creates a weather pattern and this weather pattern is a very large heat exchange mechanism geared up from the sun um, which distributes the warmth from the equator throughout the world. The moon has its, its quite extreme temperatures because it doesn't have an atmosphere and it goes as over 100 degrees C in the sun and well below 150 degrees C minus 150 degrees C when the sun's not shining on it. However, the earth's got quite a constant climate. Within that climate we still have extremes and man has made to live within those extremes. This is a picture of Gurum which is in the part middle of Turkey and there's dwellings that have been built within the cave structures and they use thermal mass and just a primitive ventilation system and this is one technique in a very hot and dry climate. On the extremes man has found dwellings in as far as igloos. Um, Eskimos are nomadic people and during the summer and during the spring they live in tents made from seal skin but in winter time they make quite an economic design, which is the igloo. The dome shape is quite a good structure, but also it enables a very low surface temperature, low surface area for a maximum amount of volume inside. And it harbors um, the way the entrance is built from very ex extreme winds coming in. On the bottom right-hand corner is a section inside the igloo. Um, these dwellings, you, you can have minus 40 degrees C outside, but quite sustainable 15 degrees C inside, so there's quite a climatic difference. There's, it's surrounded by seal skin, so there's a cold air between the ice and the seal skin, so there's an insulation barrier, and you can see a little entrance doesn't work. Um, 
the, the living quarters is mid-level of the igloo, and the low level is where the cold air stays. Um, ventilation shafts is pierced through the top of the igloo, and stagnant air gets removed in that way. Okay, thanks. Another extreme of climate, this is in Goa, on the beaches of Goa, which is quite a simplistic form, but it, there's no rain and man has provided a dwelling for themselves. They have shading, which keeps you cool, and they use um, the prevailing wind to get some form of ventilation through. You can't control the climate, but man has formed uh, ways of adapting dwellings so that they could make it more acceptable for them to live in. A lot can be learned from animal architecture and one of the greatest and most inventive forms of ventilation of animal architecture are the termites. These are termite hills in the steppes of Australia and um, it's orientated, they're compass termites, and they're orientated whereby the broad side um, of these constructions face east and west, while the narrow sides face due north and due south. This makes it so that it, it doesn't overheat in the early morning or late evening sun. Um, this is a cross-section of how termites' nests work. They're like white ants, but they aren't part of the ant family, they're part of the roach family. And they need considerable amount of ventilation. And millions, over millions, live in each of these constructions. The termites live below the earth, level um, and up above the ground is the ventilation chambers. Termites don't live within these ventilation chambers and they are only found in the making of them and repairing of them. In the lower chambers they have a fungus where, which ferments and creates a warmth which generates heat upwards and through um, through the nest. Two forms of natural ventilation is one is wind generated and the other is thermal generated. So this creates a thermal um, buoyancy upwards. And also you have a balloony effect which pushes through and pulls stagnant air outwards. The, the three lines going down is lines where these termites dig right down to the water table and bring upwards and line the inside skins of the nest with water. This, through evaporative cooling, cools the air. So fresh air, being colder, comes driven downwards. Um, and there's a balance between the fresh air and the extract air. Also, these creatures need about 80% to 90% relative humidity. So uh, the cooling and the, the water skins of the sides provide this humid climate for them to live in. This is a section within it, within the termites nest, where you can see the ventilation chambers um, going upwards. And this is the outside um, of one of the construction of a, of a termites nest, where you can see the ventilation slightly outside. These are very, very hard, like cement forms. Um, both the outside and the inside of the structure is porous. Um, these are actually what the termites look like. The, the central termite is the queen termite, and they do over 30,000 eggs a day, and she's serviced by her king termite, and all the rest, which is in the middle, and all the rest are her workers. So he's quite a busy boy. 
This is a termite's nest in India, and I'm going through a few because um, just the way the termite's nests are constructed, although they do the same function, the way they look slightly different towards the climates they exist in. And this is another termite's nest in Western Africa where there's got very heavy rainfalls um, and they've got mushroom shapes that protect it from the rainfall. And as designers, we try to get the function of these buildings, but we also have to be sensitive to the environments that we live in. So these natural forms um, are very reassuringly familiar and they don't change very much, but the, the functions um, are quite important. A, a form of ventilation in, in reverse from the, the plant animal, I chose a cactus. One, one of these, um, they, they live in Mexico, in South America, and they have very little rainfall, so there's one big downfall, and they accumulate all the water in the girth. But the pines, apart from keeping other animals from getting to the sap and extracting the moisture, evaporation and strong winds is a, a danger to these, anim, to these plants. So these spines create um, a shroud of still air around it and it buffers um, evaporation and helps it survive in a very hostile environment. And this also gets used within buildings. So you can see the spines here. And within that and the plant, you get a quite a still form of air. Coming on to primitive architecture and how people have lived. This is in um, Tunisia and uh, these are hashes which are cut in the red sandstones of the rock and they're excavated down below. They're some 10 to 15 meters in diameter and they go down to depths of 5 to 6 meters and families and whole communities live within these in a very hot climate and what this does is form like a, a, a thermal lung and until and unless the sun is directly overhead when the whole um, area is under sunshine all the other times when the sun is at a lower angle the sh heavy shadows are cast on part of the wall the combination of heavy shadows and the cooling effect on a wall and the very hot side on the other side of the wall creates a thermal imbalance. So air circulates within these um, hollows. Cold air goes down on the shaded side and rises up. Um, these are usually two stories. The upper stories are kept for storing wheat and, and grain and the lower stories are, are vaulted chambers which are used for dwellings and these chambers pretty much keep a relatively stable temperature throughout. Um, this is the basis of how courtyards developed and this is the principle of how courtyards developed which we now know today. This is um, an example of a courtyard in Seville and you can see the casting of like shadow and extreme sunshine. This is a good example in an Arab architecture where you have a very heavy shadow and very bright sunshine and it works. During the night time all the heat radiates out. You have very heavy masonry structures that buffer and have a very high t um, temperature time lag difference. And also you can see um, through the panorama that all the buildings are relatively the same height. Um, so air, wind tunnels and channels and all aren't affected. It's just a thermal buoyancy that occurs within the courtyard. It's very peculiar to Arab culture initially. And then with the Mughal Empire it spread into India and from India 
gone throughout the world through Europe and it's now quite a design feature. Just to prove the case, this is a courtyard in the VNA. Um, so it's a form of building design and it's used quite frequently in naturally ventilated buildings. They've got a clean side and dirty side and um, you could buffer the building to quite Narrow streets and very hot climates are used in a similar effect. And so you protect yourself from direct sunshine, heavy shadows, lots of thermal buoyancy, and air would naturally flow through these buildings, naturally meaning there's no mechanical devices. Um, and in, in hot climates, winds are encouraged to bring down both the ambient temperature and also to create a, a degree of comfort where mo air movement is um, accentuated and you have um, perspiration and evaporation from your cooling, the natural means of humans cooling. The top picture are wind scoops. Um, they're situated high above, so they can't, and these aren't, they're semi thermal driven, but mainly wind driven. The higher up you go, the, the, the faster the winds are because there's no frictional forces, there's less frictional forces, so there's a higher temperature gradient. And they are captured in these w wind scoops and go down within the tunnels and ventilate the building accordingly. This is a section of how it works and it's very <coughs> similar to how the termites nest work, the same principle. In hot climates, over and above, these also can have cooling, very simplistic cooling devices such as porous pots filled with water, charcoal or straw filled with water. And air being blown over these devices, there's evaporative cooling. The water loses its um, energy, <coughs> in its top molecules, and it cools the water and provides a cool, natural way of um, keeping the climate down temperatures down within the dwelling. This is another example of wind scopes. Um, these are a decorative feature used in Egypt which uh, ventilates the building in a similar way. They've used it, incorporated it in, within the architecture and uh, it's just mud and plaster and they make a decorative feature of, of these. This is a picture in Pakistan where they've got wind scoops. Temperatures could come down as much as 15 degrees C in these and they're facing, they are turned to face the prevailing wind. In this photograph you can see there's not so much restrictions on planning permission and each person gets their fair share of wind. There's another photograph in Pakistan and uh, quite densely, these countries with a lot of heat densely, pop, you know, build so, um, to, you know, to keep off the, the sun. In, in more temperate climates, very strong winds are excluded um, and in urban design these things are excluded. This is quite a popular and quite a vernacular architecture, the three bedroom uh, semi, which works very well as a naturally ventilated means. It gets you know, used by windows, doors. And the, the combination of natural ventilation, you have infiltration, which is the leakages through cracks, and natural ventilation, which is controllable, such as shafts and windows. They're both at the mercy of nature, so thereby it can sometimes be grossly inadequate and sometimes grossly in excess. And this is one of the features in building, natural ventilated buildings, um, is the balance of. This is a cross-section area of a modern building using natural ventilating process, both with the stack effect. The stack effect is the temperature buoyancy effect, the difference between the heat rising up and bringing it through and also you have an entrainment of air 
through the top end and it will pull the air through. These um, allow the floor areas to be larger, um, the plan of the buildings larger. Um, stacks are usually quite considerable in size. I mean, I've seen some designs where these stacks are the size of drain pipes, but they really don't work that size, and they're part of the feature. Um, Max Borden uses them, and they're quite you know, considerable to make the, 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 the ventilation process work. This is a more modern way of bringing in um, natural ventilation. It's, it uses the simplistic forms, and it's, it makes it a more hybrid building um, and mo more controllable um, and ha more harmonic harmonizing. How it works, you have on the, on the right hand side is glass which is facing the south and gets direct solar gains and heats up the chimney and there's a greenhouse effect. At the back there's a black coloured surface which also accentuates this. And at the top there's a, an orifice which creates the ballooning effect and pushes the ventilation up. So it just assists, helps to assist a process and helps it along the way and it's just one way of many that modern buildings um, are using to ventilate. This is a cross section of a building which with a deeper plan and just going through it quickly it uses a few hybrid techniques and the design of it incorporates um, uses the form, the orientation, the insulation, um, all help to assist in natural ventilation. Also with, within the building you have punker fans and set areas for um, the air to escape. Um, and this is the Greenpeace building which is um, another form of hybrid building and uh, Peter will talk more on this one. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, well, it's great to. Uh, very interesting, a nice introduction of all those uh, amazing, very simple, very sort of pure ideas. Uh, kind of makes you think that, you know, architecture has got far too complex recently, um, and we actually ought to be getting back to much more simple methods of environmental control. Um, can I have the other slides? Um, that was a slide of the Greenpeace building. Which, as Keith said, we, we designed about five years ago, well, we refurbished five years ago. Um, and the engineer on that was uh, Keith's partner, uh, Patrick Bellew. Um, and essentially, we were asked to, this, there's the building again, we were asked to look at this, but it's a big four square building, about 20 meters square in Islington, um, and to look at uh, converting it from its uh, former use, which is a kind of animal experimental. Um, place where people experiment in animals, you know, it's kind of, Greenpeace kind of liberated it from this uh, former rather sordid past. Um, so it's a, it's a 20, 20 by 24 meter square building on four floors, very, it's very solid, uh, high thermal mass building, um, and with windows on the big air, uh, windows on the north, west, and south elevations. Um, does this work? No. That one work, right. And essentially what we did, the, the, the kind of two main interventions that we made were to put a, a tube down the middle, cut a hole in the middle which, was a, which had contained a suspended staircase which then actually linked together all the, the floors of the building. Um, and also um, reglazed the whole building with low E glass, very highly insulating glass. And where necessary, particularly on the south elevation here, we used combination of shading and light shelves to bounce light into the building. Uh, Keith talked primarily about uh, 
um, ventilation in buildings and ventilation, ventilation strategies, I guess, are the subject of this talk, but you can't kind of separate those out from the amount of light and therefore sunlight and heat that you end, let into a building and the thermal mass of the building which is there to, to kind of soak up that heat. Uh, so the, if we look at that in um, a little bit more detail, that south elevation, what we've got there is um, a top ventilator, high level ventilator, which um, is, we were going to have these operated on a kind of facade basis, but they ended up being operated um, on, a, on a kind of structural bay basis. Uh, but they're high level vents to actually allow uh, air to flow across the building using wind driven ventilation. Um, and low level vents which were just controlled by the person next to the window to provide additional ventilation in kind of peak summer conditions. And of course we, we've got the combination of the two different kinds of ventilation that Keith was talking about here. Allowing free air across the building, and, which is wind-driven ventilation, and, al and allowing it up the, that stack of the staircase in the middle, which is, which is uh, thermosiphoning stack-driven ventilation. And this, this, I guess, encapsulates all the kind of environmental ideas that we put into the building, really. That, I mean, a very simple perimeter heating system uh, insulating this bit of wall. We didn't bother to insulate the, therm the, the, the structural masonry in between the windows um, be because we, we reckoned we needed the thermal mass. We didn't put a suspended ceiling in so, so that we allowed the thermal mass of this floor to be exposed to the air. What we did do is drop uh, these canopies, which are kind of uh, cotton canopies, just fabric canopies stretched between the structure to actually lower the apparent ceiling height. We had 4.2 meters here, floor to floor. Um, and to, and to bounce, bounce the light down, both from uplight, an uplighting system here and from uh, light that would be reflected into the building, both from external kind of louvered light shelves here and a very simple fabric light shelf here. Um, and that just kind of puts those, uh, those images together, showing the, showing the stack right the way through the building. Now uh, you can't kind of see the roof light and ventilation system on the top. And on the lower floor where we, we've got these fabric canopies, um, on the upper floors, the, the ceiling heights were lower, so we didn't use those. And, and this is a kind of semi-basement level, which was controlled in a slightly different way. Uh, the, the, the office plan, I mean, in order to, we had to spend a lot of time convincing them to kind of go, you know, go open plan, essentially, rather than having enclosed offices. Because as soon as you start partitioning a space, of course, you, you'd, you stop that cross-ventilation that's necessary to to cool a building like this in summertime conditions when you've got a lot of solar gain potentially, um, uh, a lot of gain from, from, inter, from internal gains from people and equipment as well. Um, and we, the, the system is based, there are sort of team based areas all the way around the outside of the buildings with sort of about four to six people in each of these bays. And then there are little central meeting spaces in the middle of each floor here. And those, with those we, inst we instituted a kind of uh, a small heat reclaim ventilation system with air being pulled in here through a duct and pulled out here through a duct. And in this core area here, um, there is a heat transfer system which allowed you to take heat out of the extract air and put it back into the in, in input air so that in winter you weren't using a, a, an awful lot of heat. Um, sorry, going on. Okay. Well, no, that's, the, that's the kind of team base area, I guess, and shows very basic sort of office partitioning system that we'd, we'd kind of designed within the context of you know, designing for Greenpeace, making kind of robust sort of structural, simple timber partitions rather than the kind of crap that you usually get as a sort of office, standard office system which is full of real nasty materials. Um, so that it's the, the, all the materials that we used in the building were essentially went through a kind of very simplistic green auditing process of, of deciding what was in them and whether they were kind of environmentally sound or not. Um, and this is what it kind of looked like. Here you're looking at the ground floor with this, these existing structural steel columns, the exposed ceiling above and the fabric canopies. Um, and the, these are sort of lower canopies, just bent sheets of plywood held in a steel frame that actually act as as kind of focuses for these spaces here. This, this shot actually shows um, partitions up to about two meters here. In fact, a lot of the areas beyond are kind of open areas, but we designed um, you know, partitions to a series of different heights according to who was going where. Um, 
And this, is a, this is a, occurs on every floor as well, and this is just a very, very simple device to actually increase air movement. You all know what it is, I mean, it's just it's a 40 quid punker fan that you can buy from B&Q or whatever. And it just, by increasing air movement, you actually create a, a tiny bit of extra cooling that will take two or three degrees off the apparent sort of skin temperature in the middle of summer. Um, and this shows the, um, the new sort of Douglas fir windows here. And you can just see behind the plants there the high level opening gear for these vents. Um, the top row of, of, of um, windows here was actually, kind of did have a kind of solar tint on it on that, on that floor. And this is working our way around and the canopies where they meet the one partition through the building which is next to the staircase, uh, they kind of get distorted. Canopies are kind of fun. They, they, uh, people were very worried about the cleaning of them you know, and taking them down or whatever. They, they actually have had them for four years and they've never actually cleaned them. They don't look too bad. I was there a few, year, few weeks ago. Um, and what's happened is that it's become, as well as, I mean, it started out life uh, as, as a kind of environmental control device, you know, of, of a light reflector and whatever. It's actually become much more of a sort of an image thing for the building, um, which is okay for Greenpeace and sales and God knows what. Um, and then this is looking at the central tower in the middle, the central um, so ventilation shafts come staircase, um, which, which uh, links all the floors in a much clearer way than the fire escape stair of the existing building, which is located in the corner. And um, a simple south-facing kind of light scoop on top with a, a ventilator at the back of it here. Um, the upper floors are actually enclosed for smoke control, uh, but the lower two floors are open to this staircase. Um, which hangs from um, two, two, well, four stainless steel wires down the middle of, the, of this space um, and eventually ends up at a bridge a across here at ground floor level and then this is the, the tiled floor of the, of the lower floor. So we're kind of playing a game of very, very much of it, it, the, the materials and the building gets lighter as you, as you, as you kind of go up through the staircase. Um, that's another view of it from down below. This is looking down then into the lower floor. It's a kind of heavyweight, lightweight staircase because it's actually on the one hand it's suspended, on the other hand it's, uh, it's uh, got these big clay tiles as the floor finish. And then down at the bottom, this was a space which was originally going to have a tree in it because Greenpeace kind of, you know, they kind of wanted a green building, symbol of a green building was a tree in the in this space, but then they discovered that actually in order to get a tree to grow in these conditions, plants that grow in buildings like this tend to be brought from Florida and they go through a kind of training process in Belgium. They, they, they learn to live in nasty indoor climates and most of them are then imported to go into shopping centers and offices in this country. And they, they seem to be highly ungreen and so what they did was get Andy Goldsworthy uh, to, to create this sculpture which he made out of mud that was dug out of the back of the, of the back garden of the, of the space, which is kind of very symbolic then of the, of, of the London clay. He wanted to create this hole that went right down through, through, through my damp proof course and down into, the, down into the earth, but actually we convinced him it might not be a good idea because the they might get water bubbling up there. Anyway, yeah, that was kind of fun. It looked, obviously, to start with, it was just kind of pure and pristine, and then it kind of cracked up and got this I mean, really intricate and delicate sort of patterning on it. That's the building at night showing the uh, canopies on the first floor there and, and the effect of the uplighters. Um, and that's the, the south elevation. Obviously, most of the elevations weren't transformed at all. Here, what we did was take down this fire escape stair and re-erect it. Um, recycling a lot of the treads but making new landings um, and here you see these the kind of light shelf and shading devices suspended from wires that you actually can't see there on the, on the outside of the building so we just kind of gave it a, a, a facelift generally but the interior architecture of this was basically generated from the from the energy concerns in the building I guess energy and materials concerns just like to show you a, a few other couple of other projects. This one, I mean, it, it, it relates to the whole subject of, of air in buildings, but we have, to, we have to treat this very differently because this had to be a sealed building. It's a recording studio of Peter Gabriel that we built about four or five years ago. Um, and 
actually just beyond where that tree is there, is that's the edge of the 125 line from, from Bristol to Paddington's, and he, building a recording studio 50 yards from the place where the trains are going uphill very steeply is not a quite sensible thing. So, I mean, inevitably, this had to be a completely sealed building, but generally, recording studios are buildings that are very much sealed within existing buildings. They're generally in the middle of cities. Um, and so this is the first time that we actually built a recording studio, built a, certainly a control room like this in, in the real world, kind of thing in the outside world. And, um, and it, we did it primarily, I mean, he did it primarily because he wanted to have a building that would actually benefit from natural light, benefit from, from if possible, natural ventilation, but it proved I impossible with the acoustical requirements of the space, or certainly of this main control room space. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a highly daylit space, and the way we dealt with the, the air conditioning was kind of interesting, because Peter Gabriel had this, that just shows you the plan of the, there's a mill pond and a mill stream that goes under the building there, and this is the existing building, and this is our new control room. Um, and just, I'm going to show you some slides of the way we dealt with the air conditioning in the existing buildings, which are studio spaces. He had this thing about the fact that plastic and metal ducts um, gave off negative ions and produce unclean air in buildings. And so we were given the brief to actually use natural materials as, as the air conditioning ducts. And within this space, which is the main three-story volume of the building, we used, uh, these are the air conditioning ducts, and you see they're actually sewer pipes. They're actually clay ducts here at this level and this level. Um, and up above, we used kind of timber. Uh, solid timber ducts. See, see another view of these things. So they just, they actually work really well because they, they, they actually have some thermal mass within them, so the, uh, within the duct itself. Um, and very simple language. I mean, all of, of a highly serviced building, but just using very ordinary kind of bits and pieces of material, of industrial materials. Um, and a, a, a highly daylit building for a recording studio. Shows, they, they weigh a lot of <laughs> they weigh a lot these things, so a lot of the time they were just suspended from stainless steel cables. And this is the return air ducts where they come down within a studio space, an existing opening that we glazed in, and they disappear. Um, or sorry, they, this is the return air. The, the air flow is actually upwards in here to back to the plant room. These are actually concrete. We couldn't get clay ones big enough, so they're concrete and they're just plastered on the outside. So again, it's that's, the air movement within the building is very much evidence of, evidence of part of the building. Uh, this is a bit of leftover one. <laughs> Speaker stand. Um, and getting light into this building, being three stories high, very narrow kind of slot of a stair well, that the only bit that we could afford is the main space. Um, and our client being very keen on natural lighting in a building, um, we just make, made it a... These cost 15 pounds each, they're, they're sort of galvanized mesh stair treads, and we just suspended them from uh, cables that ran full height of the building from three and a half floors. Um, and I, so you get a very, very transparent stairwell. I had a problem with, on, the first, on the opening night, someone was sick at the top of the stairs. Oh. <laughs> um, that's the... These bits, the, the treads might cost 15 pounds, but these things, these very beautiful little yachting fittings cost about 100. Uh, and then we built, as a second phase, this new control room that sticks out the back, and it's actually, it's designed as an extremely heavy building. It is a very heavyweight building. There are three layers of glass everywhere. There's a window, and each layer of glass is 20 millimeters thick. But, um, and all the glass faces north, so there's very little solar gain, apart from the, the roof light, which is uh, up there, is very heavily shaded. Um, and again, the, the air conditioning there was actually built into the internal concrete frame. We had a the philosophy for that was very much generated from, from the client, I guess, in this instance, was that nothing should be uh, hidden away. Um, and so you, you saw the structure of the building, really. Uh, it's very disappointing to find that this thing here costs uh, one and a half times our building. There you go. Um, just going on to um, something that we're about to start on site with. This is a... A, a, sorry, the, the, uh, this is the new headquarters for the building research establishment in, in Watford, uh, where, of course, a lot of the work, very, very valuable work on airflow through buildings is done. Um, and this is a, a new building which is designed to very stringent energy consumption 
standards, the uh, Energy Efficient Office of the Future uh, group, which has been in existence for about three or four years, which has um, set targets of, uh, in fact, uh, in this building, we're working to 85 kilowatt hours a square meter per year for the overall energy consumption of the building. So, in order to meet those targets, we, we really we can't even um, we, we have to rely on natural means, which is actually very nice because that's what we want to do. Um, but you have to really carefully control both uh, the the artificial lighting in the building because that becomes in an office building a very high percentage of the, of the um, overall energy consumption, so you have to make maximum use of, ne of daylighting, and, um, and you have to very carefully deal with uh, ventilation to deal with internal gains. And what we've ended up with is, is uh, a, a very simple section of the building with, uh, on the south elevation here, a series of uh, ventilating chimneys. Uh, this is the this is working drawings, actually, of showing the south elevation here, of alternating chimneys and glazing elements and where we've got glazing we've got glass louvers set out from the building about one and a half meters that actually are adjustable and uh, can act as as, uh, as diffusers for, for solar gain um, and the chimneys themselves also protrude from the building and therefore cut off the low angle incident sunlight in the morning and the afternoon. very simple section of the building there. So there are two kind of elements working together here, or three elements working together in terms of the ventilation and, and lighting and, and heating strategy of the building. One is, this, one is this floor slab, which has got ducts within it that are used to, to ventilate the building, either with, with wind-driven cross-ventilation through those ducts, right the way through the building, uh, supplementing the so, uh, so cooling that bit of the slab, but also supplementing the cooling that you would get from wind-driven cross-ventilation through these vents here and here. Um, and essentially, the, the, the building is regarded as a kind of 90% wind-cooled building, 13 and a half meters deep, um, three stories high, three and a half meter floor to ceiling height. But on, on still summer conditions, those are the really tricky ones to deal with where we haven't got the wind-driven ventilation. So we've installed the, these, the stack vent system really to cope with those uh, peak temperatures. And that is basically a glass, it's a glass block fronted stack here, which uh, you has louvers at this point here, which open and the warm air within this stack warms up and, and the, the, uh, the and is exhausted at the top. And obviously this has to be much higher than the surrounding roof. Um, and that, that, those can draw air either from the space here or from the or again from this duct here, which in turn draws air from the center of the building. Um, so there's all kinds of air passages through this building. There's different, there's louvers on both sides. And essentially what, the, I mean, the engineer on this is uh, Randall Thomas and Max Fordham, and he, he thinks, he describes it as a kind of baggy building, you know, baggy design, kind of, you know, can kind of lose heat here, there, and everywhere, and it's a kind of loose fit solution. Loose fit, but, but actually carefully controlled because all these, these vents are actually BMS controlled and controlled by a building energy management system with manual override. So if you want, as an individual, you can take control over your own space. You might screw up the energy, energy of the building, but at least you kind of feel that you are in control, which is actually a very important factor in terms of people's of human comfort. Oops, I've switched it off, haven't I? Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Um, how are we doing for time? This, this, fine. This is um, um, just a more detailed version of that, of that elevation, and you can see here's the adjustable louvers. This is a, these are glass sheets which span 2.2 meters, uh, held, held up on, on castings each, each end, and essentially they are controlled by, they're occupant controlled here, so that they can actually, when they're in a flat position or in this, in this particular position, depending on the sun, sun angle, they will uh, reflect light back up into the building. They have a 70% frit on the glass, so they're actually 70% transparent, 70%, 30% uh, transparent, 70% um, reflective. And then, of course, you can turn them right round so that they, they act as a virtually, um, well, as a, as a, a blind, really, as a, a translucent blind that is set out from the building. And the advantage of setting it out from the building is that actually someone seated here always has a view down. Uh, Whereas if this was back here, and, they, and, and it, was a sun, it was in a, a, a closed position, you'd get sunlight at, onto this work surface here. Whereas the further out you move these, the further, uh, 
the further up they can go and still maintain the view. And I think view is actually very critical. I mean, we talk about green buildings and, and control of daylight and whatever. And if you look at, I mean, some recent buildings, I think, have, 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 that have tried to go for uh, daylighting in a big way end up with, um, you know, uh, uh, virtually, uh, I mean, Venetian blinds that are always down in front of windows and you kind of lose the, the sense of connection with the outside world, lose the view. And what we're trying to do here is, is, is actually open up that view so that even when these are in the horizontal position and it's only six millimeters of glass there, it's kind of 300 millimeter centers, you've still got a view out, um, but you've got a controllable <coughs> device that actually stops the sunlight before it gets into the building, uh, which is, again, an advantage in terms of reducing heat gain. And then here you see the slab working. The slab is actually, it's, a, it's complicated. It's very difficult to explain this building because <laughs> uh, uh, this, this is a vaulted slab and here we're looking at the high point uh, of, of the vault here, which, so you've got a vault which is in this space. Here we're looking at the low point of a vault and we've got a duct through the vault. So if, if you try and bear that in mind and we've just got to, that's the slab you see. So we've got a, the, the slab, it's a, this is doing a lot for us. Uh, in terms of, it spans seven and a half meters and yet it's only 150 millimeters thick. So we're, we're actually, it's, it's actually a, uh, it, it's a very economical structure. And what, what we've got is, I mean, the, what you're seeing here is, is, the, is the structural beam that supports that slab. But uh, beyond that tie beam, there is a vault there. So you get a kind of vaulted ceiling, pseudo sort of inland revenue kind of thing. But uh, here, we're actually using the space in, up above as well, because we're using that depth space as, a, as, a, as another breathable vent through the building. And we can then cool the building at night by passing air on both surfaces in the slab. Um, that's a section that's a little bit of a model through it, just through a, through a, a six meter bay with this uh, structural element. And you see the two volts and the, the duct that goes through to, this is the solar driven stack ventilation system on the front of the building. And that's just the working section through the... It's doing everything for us, this, actually. It's quite, so we've got, we've got the, the, the uh, curvilinear form of the ceiling, which is actually breaking up the monotony of the ceiling space um, and, and acting as... We've got some uplighting onto this and some, as well as downlighting from highly, fluores highly efficient fluorescence. Um, we've got our ducts through this, through this slab um, we've got a raised floor above those ducts for servicing the space above. And above the high point here, we've got a screed that actually contains heating pipes, in, uh, cooling pipes rather, heating and cooling pipes. And we're, so we're actually using that as the heating system through the building. And we're, we're in summer, we're passing groundwater, which is taken from 60 meters below ground and passed through there actually to just to add additional cooling to that, to that slab. And that's how the thing works together in three dimensions, although it actually probably is even more complicated to try and read it there. But here's, this is an access walkway. Here's the glass louvers, stacks, and the vents that allow air either into the ducts uh, within the slab or into the high point of the vaults in the space. Something di totally different is another building that we're is, is, is just started on site, but again, it uses the same sort of principles in terms of thinking about the way airflow can be used to cool buildings. This is a theatre for Beedale School in Petersfield, Hampshire, and it's actually, it's a very, uh, it, it's in, uh, an entirely green oak structure, and it's an entirely timber building. It's got timber on every face, inside and outside, roofs and walls and everything. Um, and this is the auditorium structure here and the, the backstage area and a foyer. Um, and it's designed primarily for theatre in the round, but can also be used using the backstage as a proscenium. And from the airflow and, and energy point of view, the neat thing about it is, is just a very simple, it, what, what we call a, a, a hypercoarse floor, really, but it's a hypercoarse floor, floor designed to store cool rather than heat. Um, because in, in performance conditions, particularly in summer, basically you would normally need to air condition a space like this. Um, in Petersfield, you don't have any problems with noise, particularly in this particular site, and therefore we can look at natural ventilation. In order to get natural ventilation to work for us, what we're doing is actually using the underfloor space here, which is kind of solid concrete and block work. Um, 
a network of little walls to create uh, a store for kuth. And so you ventilate the whole space during the, during the night. You, allow, you open this vent at the top here. Air is drawn in at the bottom because this, this, this building is on, is on a slope and the, uh, the, the, there are vents at the side here out direct to the outside air. So you, we get air passing right the way through, this, through the structure and cooling this, this particularly this lower floor. Um, and then you seal it up for when the, until the performance starts. And when the performance starts, you open these vents again. And so you're then drawing outside air in through the cool store. Um, and you're exhausting all the heat that generally comes from this area, which is the lighting gantry. So it's a very simple kind of um, you know, natural ventilation system, really. A lot of the inspiration came from this kind of thing, which is the, 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 other, the only other all timber buildings that I know are the stave churches in Norway, which have this kind of very solid, massive timber structure, and they kind of, you know, they kind of smell of wood, everything about them, which is amazing. This is a more detailed drawing showing the, our oak frame structure with oak trusses, which is a combination of oak and stainless steel, in fact, at this level, and then, uh, uh, and the stainless steel uh, gantry is suspended in the middle here, and a, a ventilating uh, system on the top. Preliminary sketch of foyer. A um, bit of oak. I don't know where that focus it probably doesn't focus. A dragon tie, that is, between two trusses. Great stuff, actually. It's all kind of green oak. It's all designed, you have to design it, though, so to cope with shrinkage. Everything shrinks. And these are just some, um, some CFD models that we did. Uh, again, Max Fordham with the engineers on this, just to look at the way. Uh, I mean, this is the main source of heat, as I said. These are different sort of uh, looking at different ways in which of wind, how the, how the wind could affect the stack effect. Because that's the, the big thing about dealing with natural ventilation in buildings that we've learned is that you, know, you can either think about the thing being driven by the wind or you can think about it being driven by stack effect. And it's very difficult to, to kind of decide um, what's going to happen at the interfaces between when you've got no when you've got no wind and therefore you're just t totally reliant on the stack. Um, and there, is the, there was the possibility, we've changed the design of this, of this ventilation canopy two or three times. Uh, we've made it much more open than it originally was. It was originally kind of just a series of louvers, but we were told by wind experts at uh, Bristol University that actually um, we should allow as much as possible kind of cross ventilation through, through the space, uh, through this top space here. Um, so we've now got kind of very big uh, louvers on all four sides of that, uh, of that ventilation unit. And, and this was just basically looking at what the maximum internal temperatures might be. And whereas we're getting something like, I think the red represents 30, 30, 30 plus degrees plus, um, we are getting temperatures. I think we can control it down to 25, 26 in our worst sort of summer conditions. And just to finish with, um, another building that we did with Patrick of Atelier 10, um, just after we'd finished Greenpeace, um, we were asked to look at this uh, problem of, they were, uh, of a, a building, a pavilion building in the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, which is, uh, some of you may know, it's just a big, uh, it's about sort of 300 acre capability brown landscape in, in, um, near Wakefield. And um, they wanted a building in, in uh, 13 weeks. And uh, this was our response, which is it is basically a, a gallery building, gallery, foyer space, and meeting rooms, although it actually all ended up as display space in the end. And essentially, it's a steel box that's supported on steel posts with timber floor and timber cladding and a fabric roof. So this is a, a kind of rigid framework that is supporting the edge of the canopy here. Um, and the masts here support the ventilation tower on top of the building and it's got an internal skin and an external skin here so this central space has its own internal lining and in fact in between the two we, we to make it kind of appropriate for winter use we, we later on in the design process this was an earlier sketch earlier plan and we added insulation at this level and this level so that the thing became an insulated uh, insulated lightweight structure um, and in terms of ventilation 
I used to add easier. This, this, extended, this extended cap here is just sucks air out of the building, which is, uh, is related to four uh, intakes here, which are just very simple louver, louver glass controls. So um, we've got, I think, four louvers at the top here, two of which um, operate a sort of a trickle ventilation system and two which are designed for, for summer conditions. Um, and that's what, that's what it looked like. And it just kind of, it went up in 13 weeks. It was open on time. <coughs> the roof took a day to put on. It was great because I got an excited phone call from the client saying, it looks like those great seagulls landed in my lawn. You know, cool. <laughs> and this is the, 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 the vent tower on top of the building. So, I mean, and these are the, the intake louvers here. So in terms of airflow, it's just kind of designed as a very simple um, self-ventilating structure. And there it is, poking its head over the uh, lawn next to this uh, sculpture. Um, I've, I could go on to show you very briefly, enough, but how are, we, how are we doing for time? Flick through them. Flick through them. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a minute. Okay, well, I'll show you this because we just finished it, and I just took some slides the other day. So it, it has, it's, again, to do with light, uh, light and ventilation through a deep section. So it's a school in the middle of Bath, uh, in, the, in a walled garden, walled garden, grade one listed building. First, upside down. Maybe they're all upside down. Section, a grade one listed building, section, step section. This is our building. Just built into the ground and section through building, seven classrooms in a row. Changing section, this is just really what I want to show, which is this bit is standard, which is letting light in here, control light, overhanging eaves, ventilation, all the way through there. And light here, which it always bounces in, so it never actually gets, uh, the, this is always light, but there's no problem with glare. And the section changes as you go through the building. So this is actually the entrance area here. But you can see those common areas continue right the way through. Here is where we've got one classroom over the other. And here's, here we've got a hall above a classroom. And the other constant, of course, is this service wall and service zone at the back of the building. Finished building, main entrance and hall behind. Uh, the roof lifts up at anywhere where you go in. Um, so you go, some of the kids go in here, so the roof lifts up and provides them with a canopy for their entrance. Uh, solar control glass here adjustable louvers here, so very careful control of, of and, and, and all these are, these are all opening windows here, so and the, again, the building can breathe right the way through that bit of facade and is daylit through that facade. This is just looking out the back to kind of light scoops, and we made, the kids can open these windows, so we made them it's kind of big and chunky, but big and chunky frames, but small windows. Um, again, this is the area that's all important. Uh, opening lights, louvers, and, and this bit of glass, which doesn't need the louvers because it's, it's got the overhanging window. Upside down. <laughs> upside down. Not upside down, but that's just the, this, it's like someone's drilled a hole right the way through that series of top floors. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much, Peter and Keith. That was really interesting, and I'm really sorry we had to cut you short. Um, but as usual, we'll go up to the bar and have a drink, and if anyone has got any questions, um, maybe they can grab Peter and Keith if they feel like answering them um, up in the bar. So thanks very much again. Thanks, Keith, Peter. Thanks.